Cool. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode. This time I'm sat down with uh, Tomiwa, who is, uh, he's worked at some cool places, uh, IBM and now Google as well. So uh, he, he's big time now. He's, he's done some good stuff. And uh, yeah, really excited. We're going to talk about those two companies, the application process and uh, what it's like working there. So I hope you find this really, really valuable. Um, but yeah, firstly, let's let's dive into it and uh, give everyone a quick background about you and and where you're working and what you're doing. And also just off the bat, I'd love to know from your perspective, seeing as that you've hit such a big milestone there so early on in your career, like did you, was this like part of the plan? You know, did you see this coming or you kind of like surprised the way you're at? That's kind of what I want to know as well. Yeah, so uh, start off, hi, Tomiwa. Uh, nice to meet everyone who's watching. Uh, from Northwest London, went to uni in UBA, University of East Anglia. There's not many of us, but Whoever is watching, you know, in Norwich, study computer science, uh, did my placement years, as Toby said, we'll get into that. And the question about what happens now, I guess, is a really interesting one. I was thinking about that as well, but I guess this, there's always space to learn. And I've always said to myself, like, in those 20 years, in those 20 to 30, just pick up as much as going and then we'll see how it gets. But yeah, it's a, it's a good place to start. I cannot lie to you. Um, mm. yeah. But are you like surprised or did you, was this like a plan? You had it all figured out or, or what? How did that happen? Because Google, well, both Google and IBM, you know, it's for a lot of people, that's, it takes them a long time to progress to that level. So I'm, I'm curious about yeah. that. So with um, uni, I remember going in knowing I wanted to do a placement year. So it wasn't necessarily IBM. It was, let me just do software development slash engineering so I know I actually like this. So when I was applying, going through, you know, you look at different companies, all this. And then as I was going through the application process for IBM, I was like, whoa, this is actually happening. Oh, this can, so I feel like when I got the IBM one is when the confidence came that, okay, even though I want to do software engineering and development, let me see about those companies I was YouTubing and dreaming about in college. Let me see if I can actually start applying there and get my, get my foot in the door. Really. Mm. So you kind of like dreamed about it and you kind of never set up like a barrier to say you couldn't do it, right? You just kind of had that goal and then you just sort of break it out piece by piece, right? Like you don't sort of get enamored with the bigger picture. You just like break it down to that one application and then that one interview and, and kind of go from there. Yeah. Exactly. As well, and a big thing as well was I am a shameless applier. Like I, <laughs> if I get it, if I don't get it, it's cool. But let me just at least apply. It's like you don't buy a ticket, right? So... Um, that was my whole mentor, my ethos going through it. So, yeah, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Like lowering, almost lowering the expectation for yourself, and you know, exactly. sort of taking away the power that the rejection has. You know, like it's. I don't know if you can see my my little puppy walking around in the background. Yeah. I hope it's, it's not distracting anyone. But um, yeah, you're you're just sort of taking the pressure off yourself and lowering the bar a little bit, which I think is really really good. So, I guess firstly, then why why tech? Why did you want to work in tech? So tech kind of came from all the way back in secondary school type of, that's when I feel like year nine is when I started looking at, oh, you can make games. Like what? I'm playing all these games. I can make a game myself or you can make an app. Those are the things that were in my head. Like, yes, games and apps, even though I don't do it now, but it was the idea of you can actually just make anything. And it kind of coincided with what um, my dreams jobs were before. So when I was in secondary school, I don't know why, but it was always architecture. Like everyone that knows me knows architecture, um, design, build, design, create, da, da, da. And I feel like when I started going more into tech, I realized there's a lot of similarities in the idea of you design your architecture or your software and you think about, okay, what are the constraints? Um, what are things I need to think about? How am I going to build for the future as well? But the good thing about tech, which I liked more is with an architecture, you make your designs and you take it off, right? With tech, you go from the beginning to the end. You get to do the design stage, you get to do the implementing, and then you get a product that you say, okay, this is actually me, that I coded this or I developed this to this stage. So I feel like that idea of brainstorming, conceptualizing, and then creating was always something really cool to me. Amazing. I, yeah, I think you put that so well. I'm a little bit jealous as well, to be honest. You know, I feel like I'm a bit too too old to now I mean I could I could learn it but there's so many other things to learn as well but 
you know, I couldn't imagine a better way to start, right? As we as we sit here now in 2021, if you look, if you extrapolate forward next 10, 20 years, if yeah. there was any subject you would you'd kind of put your your hat into and say, you know, that's probably the one you want to go for. I mean, computer science, understanding how to code, it's only going to become more and more a massive part of the economy. So yeah, it, I can imagine great, great way to, to start your career. And so if anyone is listening, um, they're kind of keen now, they, they've kind of heard the, the, about the growth in tech and some of the great things you said about the opportunity to really build uh, from the ground up. What would be my way of kind of uh, exploring that a bit further to see if I really do want to get into coding or software? What kind of things should I be looking at? I think now, especially even more than when I was in GCSE or secondary school is just try it out. Like with the way the climate is today, where everybody knows tech is so big, there's so many opportunities for people to just get kind of like dip a toe into it or just look at what does this mean or what is this? Like there's a lot of, I um, don't know what to call them, but there's a lot of not just the boot camps, but the just programs and the communities. I'm in a couple of communities myself as well, just getting an idea and an insight into what tech is. And furthermore, even things like this, listening to people that are in the tech or doing, I used to love these, a day in a life of this, this and this, just YouTubing what this means. Then starting on little introductory courses. I love a Udemy as well. So there's ways that even if you've got a side, you've got a main role, if you're in school, whatever, even now when you're saying you're a bit too old, it's never too late really. So it's an idea of, you can just do a side project, a mini thing, a little learning on the side. Same way people learn languages all the time. I guess coding is a language as well. So that's so, true. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to learn Spanish right now. So if anyone wants, wants to check me on that, you, you can do. So yeah, I guess you're never, never too old to learn a new language, right? Um, but yeah, no, that, that's, that's super interesting. And so in terms of the communities, what, what are some of the communities you're part of now? Yeah, so the two that I'm mainly a part of is one is called Zuntos, so X-U-N-T-O-S. I joined them when I was um, around second year of uni, actually, before I was about to go my placement year. And it's just three guys, I believe they went to university, and they kind of just thought, okay, let me, let us find a way to encourage more grads, get them onto this tech ladder. Um, and yeah, developing uh, minorities and all of this to actually see themselves and give themselves confidence to get into those roles. So I would definitely check those out for anyone listening. And then the second community is a community called Archisites as well. And it's around the same mantra of helping university students, early career people. And there's a lot of people that are senior in their career in those kind of communities. So not only is there like a aspect of a informal mentorship, but there's always a question and answer. There's always Q&A type opportunities um, available, really. Amazing. That second one was Ar Archisites, you said? Yeah, Archisites. Sorry, my Archisites. phone is sliding down as you do this. No, nah, no worries. A-R-K-S-I-T-E-S, -E Archisites. Perfect. All right, there you go, everyone. No, no excuses. Go and check them out. So, all right, let's dive into those uh, two companies then. You know, before we, we get into Google and that process and your role now, um, you did a placement year at IBM, right, as a, as a software engineer. So what was that experience like? What kind of um, what kind of things were you getting on, on a day-to-day -day basis? How, how was that for you? Yeah, so with IBM, I was a uh, software developer. Honestly, they're basically the same thing, software developer, engineer, just company by company um, from how what I see What is the it. difference? Is there a difference? Or? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, does, it seems like a company thing, just the title, but... Mm -hmm work you're doing is pretty much the same. So what I was doing on that role, I was based on the front end development side. So for people that aren't familiar with software development, this is what the user can see. So we have back end, which is the databases and we, the things that talk to the database, which you can't see, the servers, and then you have the client side or the front end. Very similar to, um, well, not similar to, but when you hear of UI user interface, UI designers, is in that front end realm. So I was working in a team on a product, which is really cool. Um, I think the really good thing about being on a placement year is you actually get ingrained in an actual product. So you actually get to go through the release stages. You get to build on your skills and your knowledge. I remember when I started, I didn't even know 
any React, which is a framework in the language JavaScript. But by the end of it, I was confident in it, not only in my technical skills, but in the soft skills. OK, how do you speak to managers? How do you present your work in demos? How are you going to be on a call with product owners? How are you going to answer questions? Even I think something that was really cool to me as well was being on calls with actual clients, seeing how they react with your product. And especially as a front end engineer, that's really cool because you see that you developed it in this way and you do this, this and this to get this result. But customers who haven't actually developed it, they don't know this. So it's about, OK, if the client can't use it properly, maybe we need to iterate again and we need to go back to the drawing board, design a bit better. So yeah, IBM was really cool. It gave me the boost in uh, soft and technical skills that was really, really valuable. So anybody out there trying to do a placement year or on the fence, I I would 100% recommend it. So yeah. Excellent. And and that's really cool. You got to do, you know, you, you got the experience of, of a developer taking a project through to fruition, actually seeing a client using it. That's that's quite rare, I imagine. I used to work at BT Sport and I was a, I was a product manager for the uh, the app um, for the app on especially Apple TV, and uh, it was always the developers in the background doing all the hard work, you know. And I would just be like, oh, I want that icon to be that color, and you know, this to look like that. They do all the heavy lifting, all the hard work, and I get to take credit for it with with the client, which is quite good, or internally at least. Um, but no, that's that's really good. And so, anyone who's listening then who who's now intrigued by IBM, what what tips would you have for them? Um, is there anything that IBM kind of look for in a candidate, do you think? Is, is there any tips you really want to share? So one good thing I would say about IBM for the placement year, especially, is that they come from a standpoint of they want to get you involved in big tasks, but they don't need you to be there yet. So it's a whole year you have time to grow and expand with them. So this kind of relates heavily to people that maybe are not so confident in their programming skills who are going for software development. Their actual application process doesn't have any coding. So, um, and that's not actually rare for a, couple, a lot of companies, but it's just how you think, you know, um, how you act in group settings in your assessment centers. Uh, then you have your standard like psychometric tests and the, like the mathematical tests and all of this stuff. But the idea of IBM is, trying to get a candidate, in my opinion, that is ready to learn and has a foundation, but maybe you're not the best at tech or development yet. That's OK, because I didn't even know the language I was using the whole year at the start. But it's the idea of are you willing to learn? Are you really to, willing to get there and get better, really? So I think it's a really, really good start. And I think what they're mainly after, again, is that willingness to learn, willingness to pick up tasks, willingness to have an impact in your product or in a feature, so on and so forth. Brilliant. So there you go. If, you, if you're listening to that, you know, show that real willingness to learn, because especially for early career roles, right? Employers aren't expecting you to be their finished product. Exactly. And, you know, they can't do a lot with, um, you know, no motivation and also no experience or, or kind of technical skills. But if you've got the motivation and those skills, you know, they, they can kind of work with that. They can teach you. Right. So that willingness to learn is, is really powerful. So. All right. Let's let's move on to uh, Google then. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure everyone's intrigued, you know, how to get a job there, what it's like. So, um, yeah. So you did your obviously your internship first. Right. And then yeah. through to the graduate scheme. So, I mean, I'm curious for for, for both. Um, and I guess they kind of pull you, you know, in terms of hiring for the grad schemes, they kind of pull from the internship crop, I, I guess. But what what was that process like then in terms of getting the internship? Let's start there. How, how was that process for you? Oh, yeah. So immediately after the placement year, jumped into the internship. And with the Google internship, there's coding involved. That's, um, I feel like, Everyone knows that it's the bulk of, OK, they're going to test you in technical skills. Um, so what that meant for me was during my placement year, just learning and studying all these um, interview type questions, because there's one thing to be in software development, but there's another thing to actually prepare for the interviews themselves. I feel like they're very heavy on your data structures, algorithm knowledge, um, Anybody out there that wants to do that, there's a lot of websites such as LeetCode. You've got your hacker ranks and they are trying to test you on, OK, we give you this question. 
how are you going to solve it with programming? How are you going to make it most efficient? What do you know how efficient it is right now? So they're just trying to gauge what your technical ability is there. So with the um, internship, the process for me was um, two coding interviews. And then from the coding interviews, there's a assessment, oh, a matching pool, sorry. So you do your coding interviews. If you're successful, you go into your matching pool. In the matching pool, managers are going to pull you out to talk to you, see what you're like. And that's more of like an informally um, introduction to the team. How do you like working? Will it be a nice fit? So on and so forth. Um, if we dive into what the coding interview is like, uh, for anybody that does development, you know you have your IDEs, and these are just programs that help you write code, really. So they're going to give you some code help. They're going to finish off some code for you. With Google, it's not really the case like that. So it's the idea of, are you able to code about that help? So before... So, code, sorry, an IDE, what, what is that? That is like a... I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but it's a program that let it's let's say it's a word for um development. So it's a Microsoft Word for development. So you run your program there, um, as you're typing it, in a lot of in program, there's a lot of functions and methods. So there's gonna be a tiny bit of help in okay, you have this object. If I do object dot, they're gonna give me a list of the methods I could use, for example. Cool. So it just yeah. makes your life a bit easier. Whereas before COVID time your Google interview might be on a whiteboard, so you don't really get that help. Um, in a COVID time, it's going to be online. So my ones were on Google Docs, and this means that you have to know your your code as well as maybe get your indenting in the right place and all of that. But aside from that technical aspect, that's the stuff you can learn on leap code in your hacker ranks. One thing that is really important is how you communicate through the interview. So one thing that is really big um, in software development that I don't think is talked enough about is it's really a team type of profession. Nobody really does anything by themselves. You don't really take a whole product from design to completion on your own. So you're always working in a team, working together. And I think the interviews kind of do a good job at replicating this because the interview is going to give you a question and they want to see how you're talking through it, how you're thinking through it. Okay, if they give you maybe more information about the question. How are you going to adapt to this information? How are you going to clarify your thoughts on this information? So as well as getting your technical prowess up there, try and make sure you're comfortable in the interview setting of typing and explaining your code throughout. And one recommendation I would give for this is try and get people that can interview you as well. So maybe people involved in software development, maybe even just your friends. Because it's very, very different, I um, feel, from doing it on a lead code and just typing out your answers by yourself, where you think of everything in your head, you write it down, to now being interviewed by someone, where you have to express those thoughts and you have to take them through what you're doing line by line type of thing. And if you don't have friends or that do it, or um, you don't have anybody that you know has the experience, there are websites available. So don't feel like you're at a disadvantage or you can't make it because of that. So there's come there's a website from I know it's called interviewing.io. And there, which is really cool, is you can actually watch previous interviews. So you can watch a mock interview and you can see, okay, this candidate did this, this, and this. Maybe it will be better if they did it like this. And that gives you kind of an insight or like a bird's eye view into the interview itself. And then not only can you do that, but you can actually request to be interviewed as well. So it means that you get the exact format you're going to have in an interview. And that really helps because then you get your communication skills going. You get your code explanation skills going as well. Um, so those are things I would really recommend for that process. Brilliant. That's that's terrific advice. That's exactly why why we want to do this, because, you know, those are some really actionable tips people can just run away with now. So I, I like that a lot. So um, you mentioned a lot of websites there. So, you know, do rewind, write those down and, and go and practice, because um, I think we what, what you mentioned there about the, the practicing and getting someone else involved. That's so key. That's the best way to learn anything, really, is by testing yourself. You know, if you think back to your studies, you you usually start off with your revision, you know, like going over lessons or whatever. You, but eventually you get to a point where you're practicing tests, right? And exactly. that's what gives you a real edge and gets you ready for an exam, right? Going through those yep. 
those horrible practice tests and, and doing badly and then turn the corner so same thing with your interviews and and it's so different isn't it when you've got to explain it to someone else uh, versus having it in your head when you have it in your head you're just cutting loads of corners you know and just sort of brushing over things and then explain to someone else I think it's even a valuable just generally explaining things to people who don't have a, a great deal of knowledge in that space if you can like the way you, you dumbed it down for me I think it shows that you know it so well you know you have to know it at a certain level to explain it to someone who has no clue um what you're talking about otherwise but um that's really good anything else was there anything else you did really well in the google process you personally like you thought you look back and thought you know what in my interview i really i don't know communicated this well or anything stood out for you personally that you you've really won at yeah so with the um the coding interview side i feel like adapting to new information is really important so with coding interviews it's not uncommon for you to get a question you to think it means something and the interview say the interviewer say no 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 that's not what i want you to do i want you to do this so how do you react in those situations and it happened to me and it's a case of uh, finalizing or communicating well with your interviewer to know what they actually require and then how do you bounce back from that how do you then alter your solution or um alter your way of thinking to make sure that you're going to hit those points but one thing I will really want to mention as well is, and I touched on it with the IBM about willingness to learn, and I'm going to touch on it again with um, getting picked out of a matching call as well by managers um, who want you on their team. And it's when I say willingness to learn, I feel like I also mean enthusiasm. So with companies, with product teams, you can research into what they do, how they're like. A lot of them have their products external, so you can actually get a bit of information. So once you know a lot about the company, not only does is that visible by the interviewer, it kind of boosts you up as well. So when I would do my like research on IBM or Google in preparation for a manager interview, it would make me kind of more excited. It's like, okay, they do this product. Okay, let me YouTube this. Let me get my notes on this. So not only does it make you more interview ready, it kind of gives you more confidence in the role to get you more excited about it. And you really want to do your interviews when you're excited because you can't really, as humans, hide your excitement. So I feel like that's one thing that maybe I feel like I did well in those processes, just being excited, being um, able to research into them and looking into the teams and the roles and then maybe seeing how it relates to your own life. So if your team does something, um, I don't know, let's say they do something A, how in your life or your livelihood or the things that interest you, how does that link? Okay, they work with um, developing countries to do this and this. Okay, um, as somebody that has come from an immigrant background or something, this relates to me because this, this and this, and I have this interest because of it. And it kind of ties the two together and gets both of you more excited and both of you on the same page, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think you can really feel someone's excitement. It's like even just in a, a friendship sort of scenario when, I don't know, you meet someone who is like a, an Arsenal fan as well, right? And you you get on well because of that. Maybe not this season because it's a, we're off to a bad start. But, <laughs> yeah, so it's like, bad, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's things like that where you, you know, that feeling of excitement when you meet someone, you've got something in common, you've got a shared interest. And what you've done there, it, like looking at their, their projects, that's giving you real insight, right? before the interview I think this is so powerful because I feel like we don't talk about it enough like we really when we often apply to a role we don't really know what that role means what it's about everyone kind of brushes over that you know job descriptions are kind of written in a certain way because they have to be they can't tell you exactly what you're going to be doing on a you know day-to-day -day basis always so looking at a project you know, looking at a product or whatever that gives you so much insight because it just the penny drops it's like oh I get it now that you start to piece everything together. Um, yeah. So I think that, that's that's really good. Uh, one thing I, re I re you realize as well is the further you go into the stages, and let's say you are having a manager interview, especially when the company you're applying for uses a matching pool procedure, mm -hmm. at that stage you get a bit more insight into what you could be doing as well. So it gives you more to research on, and more to actually say, okay, I can grasp onto this and then take that and run with it. So. Yeah, yeah, really good point. There's uh, the last podcast I put, I put out was with uh, with Kobe Ampoma, who is uh, is a talent acquisition leader, 
Um, he used to work in HR at like Nike and Asex, a really, really good guy, a really knowledgeable guy. And what he said was like, when you go into the first interview, you should try and give a percentage to how well you think you know the job. And then your your goal from the next interview onwards is to try and increase that percentage as high as you can to 100 and then use the information. So you want to gather information at each stage and then use that to your advantage in the next interview. Because if you're talking to different people, they're then going to be really impressed, which is why at the end of an interview, it's so important to ask questions. So, yeah. so important, you know, like you forget you're, you're interviewing them as well. You want to you want to be research gathering at the end of that interview and and tapping into that person and being like, you know, so what do you do in your role? You know, what what what's been your favorite projects you worked on? What what's the company going through right now? That those kind of questions, you want to gather those insights so that you have like an unfair advantage, you know, in the in the interview process, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And there's always like those type of questions. There's always even if I don't know much about the role, I always ask certain questions to make sure I know a bit. Okay, so tell me about you. What languages do you use? How does your team work, especially in the software development aspect? Oh, um, do you go through a agile type approach? Do you use, how do you work? What does it mean to do this? What do you believe about your role? So then they see that you're inquisitive, but then you actually get to know these stuff. So then further on, again, you get a bit more knowledge. And I like that percentage analogy of by the end, hopefully you know more and more than you did at the last stage. 100%, 100%. And you mentioned Agile then. I just, that brought back some some memories. Um, oh, well, I, I, I'll let you explain it. I mean, in layman's terms, it's essentially just work, building things in, in conjunction, right? Sort of um, in a more efficient, ongoing way rather than doing like sort of one releases every few months. Is that, that's probably a bad explanation. What, what would you say Agile is? It's actually, um, it kind of gets the foundation of it really well. So from a more traditional approach, you would say maybe a waterfall approach, it's very rigid. You plan, you design, you get your customer research, you implement, test, the product's done, you forget about it. So if the customers like it, they don't like it, it's kind of too late to change it. With Agile, we're working in tight loops. So usually every two weeks, we're gonna, okay, design or think about what's happening, um, and then interact with clients throughout the whole time. So when we're implementing, okay, give them a little prototype into, do you actually like this? Is this what your requirements meant? Okay, they didn't like this, they like this, let's iterate on this, let's keep on going. So that we don't have building blocks as we do with Waterfall, but we have like a loop. So by the end, the goal is for the customer to be more satisfied because they had way more visibility in the um, product from the very beginning to the very end. There you go. Much better explanation. It's it's kind of it is what it says, right? Agile. It's just like more efficient, yeah. more flexible, all that, all that stuff, exactly. right? So, so the big question then: um, What is it like working at Google? Yeah. So one thing about Google is, I feel like it is very much what a lot of people think it is. So you come in with the idea of, oh no, there's no way it's going to be this nice. Or when I say nice, as in friendly, or everybody's just um happy to help or da, da, da. but it really is one thing i'll say about google is you come in and it's like everybody's on your team because everyone's available to help you which is really cool everybody's you can message anyone from here to europe and they're going to say oh, okay yeah uh drop something in my calendar you hear that so much it's the idea of we work together so that we can be better for each other and i feel like it's a really good place as well um to actually learn and to gain more knowledge same way ibm is um it really helps you and there's the idea that you have to be a genius from the very get-go or you're going to be found out and it's uh, you're kicked out and that's it no it's a case of you did really well to get here um now let's use other people's knowledge and your own knowledge to not only help them but to help yourself as well and there's a really really strong um culture of innovation so it's done this way, but how can we do it different? How can we do it better for the customers, for the next users, the next uh, 100 billion users that may use our products again? So that's one thing I really like about Google. It's, it's like so open doors. Everybody's available to everyone. Everyone's happy to be there. And you can really see it in your meetings. Um, 
in your collaboration with people. So it's really, really cool. I do recommend it. I can tell. I can tell by the smile on your face you, 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 that you recommend it. You, you've probably been a bit spoiled, to be honest, to be, you know, traditionally you have to go through some milestones before you, you get somewhere that you're you're this happy with. So you, you, maybe maybe you'll, that'll come to bite you because you're like, oh, it doesn't get any better than this. Um, you've got nothing to look forward to. No, nah, I'm, I'm joking. I'm, I'm sure you'll have a great time there. But no, nah, it's, it's an incredible. But again, like going back to the psychology of it, I'm I'm intrigued, like, because you must now feel, you know, that's such a big hurdle to get over. That must give you a lot of confidence, like beforehand, because a lot of people I talk to, they're kind of, particularly from maybe lower income backgrounds, you know, if they've, you know, I'm talking about someone who doesn't maybe have their parents who both are working in um, the tech industry or um, professional services or something similar to what they're, they're interested in going into. Uh, a lot of them sort of feel that they can't quite, make that leap and, and get to it so you know did any of those thoughts come into your mind at all beforehand and if so how do you get around that or, or maybe maybe not I'm, I'm sort of speculating a little bit well I can say 100% yeah those things do come those those ideas of oh I don't know anyone I don't like I remember when I was starting for placement year search and then even in the google aspect I was like I don't have a LinkedIn following I don't know someone I can just call that can give me an insight into how the role is going to be okay they hired me but are they sure they really hired me like what's you get all these doubts in your head um but I think the doubts kind of ease once you start doing it and start I think I mentioned it before in be shameless of your applications you can put it out there and I hate to say it but like it won't you won't get 100% from everyone but the idea of okay um, I'm still going to apply. I'm still going to put my foot out there because the reason you're scared is because you love the job, right? You love the company. You love the career they offer. So you kind of still have to be enthusiastic and put yourself out there if you ever want to get it, right? There's always going to be times where you're nervous. I'm sure even when you're from one stage and maybe you turn into a manager, you're going to be nervous at that jump too. There's always going to be nerves in your career journey, but it's about okay, building on your prior knowledge and your prior connections that may be limited and that's okay. And still just trying to get out there, still trying to learn from people. We're so early in our careers, especially people in our university or just post-graduation like me, where it's actually expected to ask the questions. Don't feel like it makes you um, bad or it, it shows you out to not be so good. I remember in my summer internship at Google, someone I was working with, it kind of stuck with me and it, it made me laugh. I would ask him questions every so often, get my work done. And then one day out of the blue, he just messaged me and he said, you haven't asked me many questions today. That worries me because I want you to ask me questions. And there's the idea of it's okay to be at a grad level because we're grads. It's okay to be university level because we're in university. But make sure you use those resources around you. Make sure you bug people with questions because that's the only way you're actually going to get that industry knowledge that we want to gain or that industry experience that we're all looking for. So don't be afraid to tap a shoulder or connect on LinkedIn and just throw a question out to someone, even if you don't know that. People are really more welcoming than you think, I would say. People are really going to give you a, a listen to or speak or talking to if you really ask for it. Some may not, uh, I'll give you that, some may not, but I would say the strong majority of people will really be happy to help and uh, give you some advice where they can. Yeah, people people very often want to help young people especially and, and give you yeah. kind of guidance um, for whatever reason. So kind of take advantage of that and take advantage of the fact that when you are a student or you are a rec recent grad or you're on a summer internship, you're not expected to know everything. You're kind of a little bit... Um, insulated in a way that you're not when you go to an entry level position um at, you know where you're kind of given one set role and it's like we want you to deliver on this you know these sort of schemes especially at these larger corporates they are really focused and committed on learning and development because they see you as the future right so they want you to build you as a person who's going to drive their business forward over the long term not just in six months or two years so it's not it shouldn't it shouldn't be a high pressure you have to deliver this or else kind of situation and just on the rejection as well we had david on here 
a couple of uh, weeks ago who, who also works at Google and he was explaining like you know like so what if you if you apply and you don't get it you know like people there's people there that have applied three four five times and then the fifth time they, they they kind of make it through so it's kind of like yeah you applied just so what it's like it's not like you can never apply again you know so sometimes you can't apply again for another however long but maybe it just wasn't make, meant to be if you didn't make it the first time but that doesn't mean the door is closed right if anything you're going to learn from that and then then go and, and do better the next time so yeah really really valuable stuff really valuable stuff so a couple more questions before we we wrap up kind of thing I, i'm curious about you and your sort of career and where you're going to go from here and that kind of thing is there is there anyone is there any person it could be like a celebrity or a famous person or it could be a mentor is there anyone who really inspires you from a career's perspective that you've kind of learned from it could, could be anyone an athlete or uh, anyone you kind of have your eye on that you learn from and and you kind of get inspired by yeah so from a career standpoint i guess i can split into just there's people that give you inspiration that may not be doing tech and then there's people in tech that give you inspiration as well so i like to draw inspiration from people that have nothing to do with me but you just see the attitude to the hard work wanting to get better resilience especially and so you look around you see um even just parents coming from uh, nigeria coming here with nothing really and still working ways up with children mom's got a phd trying to do this this and this that type of resilience it it drives you as well it's like you you know you can do it too because you're even in a more fortunate place with the athletes, I, I love my sports. I love the football, the basketballs. You see, the I'm going to be real, these Americans know how to make documentaries. So a lot of these <laughs> like, uh, American football documentaries, even though I don't watch it that much, but the Netflix last chance used just the grind and the grit, the LeBron Jameses of the world who they spend so much on just training and self-care and all of this to prepare themselves to be better. With tech um i think everybody in like secondary school they will think like oh yeah bill gates yeah that's it bill gates everyone wants to be bill gates and then when you i feel like when i got to uni and especially now one thing i do so much is snoop on linkedin like if you see me view your profile I, i'm sorry but it's just what i do so when i see people in these higher roles i look and i look i click on their background and i see where they've come from I see how they built themselves up from, okay, entry level here. Now they were manager. After these many years, they did this and this. And a lot of them even have like activity on LinkedIn. So you see all the things they did on the side as well and all the steps they did. And okay, they went to this event and they helped out there. And it's just the idea of, oh, this is doable, especially the ones that are close to home. So maybe people, ethnic people from like a London background, it's like, wait, where they went to school is not even too far from my house. How they developed is not even that bad. They went to the same college as me. What they did this and this. They went to this uni. I may have not gone there, but I was considering it. So it's the idea of these people's lives aren't super different. So they still got themselves and they still work themselves up to that place. And that kind of inspires me seeing that on LinkedIn and looking around and seeing, oh, he's got there after this many years and he's done this and he's got this and and with those people as well, those are the people to um, throw messages to and connection to as well. There's a couple that you message, maybe they're busy, they won't get back, but some will get back, as I was saying before. So even if they don't, they can still inspire you. The same way I've never had a conversation with LeBron and he inspires me, those people's LinkedIn profile is enough to inspire me as well. So, For sure, for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, I really, really love what, what you said. That really, really re resonated with me. And just to give a perspective as well from talking to a lot of the employers that I talk to, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it, it really does transcend race. You know, it's not just about um, uh, ethnicity uh, at all. Now that we're, we're talking about building more inclusive uh, teams and corporations, right? So that means, you know, it, they're looking at this idea of underrepresentation. So we're getting away from, oh, you need to go from to this uni or you need to have gone to college you know or eventually even that you need to go to uni at all it's getting much more of a we're now keen to just see who who can develop the skills to do well in this role and actually we don't have anyone from this background so we want to 
uh, mix that in so we've got diversity of thought and idea so this wave that we're seeing now with a with bigger focus on diversity and inclusion that should i hope empower a lot of people to say actually it doesn't matter that there's no one that i know from my school who's gone on to um you know launch tesla or something or microsoft but you know you can be the first one to do it because these paths are really really changing now and uh of course i'm a massive fan of sport as well so go and watch your documentaries on netflix as well i, I like that tip as well yeah one thing i would just add to that is what you said and it's a really good point about there's always this idea of target unis and it's true some companies go to certain unis they have their university highs and all of this but there's still ways around that so i remember when i was in a level for example i know there's a lot of people that just got their results now and whatever happened all the best to you but i remember i was i was so bent on a russell group uni and when results they came i had to go through clearing i thought oh no i didn't get into a, a russell group so it's finished i'm toast i'm this but there is pathways if the uni doesn't come i mean if the career or the job doesn't come to your uni you can still apply to it it doesn't mean that you're not allowed do you see what i mean mm. and most importantly when you do get to those assessment center stages or something when you're so far in like everybody's on the same page kind of thing you apply you apply together and once you've got past that stage okay it's not your uni anymore it's you so as you're saying what's your skills how are you gonna benefit what's your willingness to learn what can you do so um that's one thing i really like especially going through that clearance stage maybe not going to the russell group uni i wanted to but having a great university um, experience and then coming out and seeing people messaging me on LinkedIn saying, oh, you got there. I didn't even know they hired people from outside Oxbridge. And it's like, no, mm. they do. Trust me. You're allowed to apply. Don't think that because you went to somewhere outside the top 10 that these roles are locked out for you. So is, is there any, yeah, I guess before we wrap up, you know, is there anything in between that clearing stage and Google? Is there anything in, in between those two, that bridge that we've we've missed off or is it, is it kind of just along the lines of what you just said, right? You just kind of went through and applied. That's all I'm hearing, to be honest. It's not, it's not as if there's some other magic element, right? You know, it's kind of as simple as, as what you've explained. Yeah, I did. The one thing I will say about clearing is um, I feel like I knew in me, I was like, I was gutted. I was like, wow. In GCSE, I feel like everybody here is gifted and talented. And I was like, I'm gifted and talented. I didn't get no A stars. In college, good college I didn't get no A's clear in here and I was like okay let me look back at what I've done where I got my most success what did I do there to help me so I remember when it's so silly but where I got my lowest grade I was using folders for my subjects I said no nah, I want to use notepads now so in uni I use notepads because I just wanted to be in that mindset of I'm going to be better and I'm going to change and I'm going to work hard and just be relentless in it and if I have to sleep in the labs or the library I'll do that so it's the I kind of changed my mindset into I'm not going to wallow in the clearing and the same way I don't want people to wallow in the rejections for the jobs that should kind of spur you on even more so okay I went through clearing what didn't I do to get those grades because those grades weren't locked out for me so how do I need to change it same way I've been to final stages on site for some internships and midway through the interview, I knew, yeah, I haven't got this. Mm -hmm. But yeah. with that rejection, what did I learn from it? How am I going to be relentless to say I'm where I was for clearing? And what did I do wrong that will make sure 100% I don't do again? Or what did I, what didn't I do that I'll make sure a thousand percent I do in the future? So that's one thing I will say. With every setback or rejection, it's impossible to tell someone not to be sad. It's okay to be sad, but learn from what made this happen try and uh, see, okay, I would try and do that, that, and that. And sometimes, hey, you, you performed your best, and that's okay, because there's a lot of applicants there. Some companies are looking for a specific type of people. That's fine. But as long as you can see from reflecting, okay, this is what I would have done better, or I actually like how I performed. Going into this next company, I might get better results, or with just a little tweak, I can do better in this way. That's always good. That's always perfect. 100 percent and you know you're not your rejection just because you didn't do well in an a level necessarily or you didn't get to the uni you wanted to or you didn't get the application that you wanted it's kind of just on to the next one you know you th that yeah. rejection isn't you that's just like if it's a basketball game that was the first quarter you got the second quarter now right you gotta 
you know, you learn from it, what, what you just said, you learn from that experience. But then, you know, when you're applying to the next job, they don't care that you got rejected from the last few places. And guess what? When it's when it's time to apply to Google or IBM, they don't care what you got in your, your A-levels to some extent. You know, sometimes there's a certain threshold, but in, in yeah. general, and as I said, the world's moving away from a lot of those requirements to be more inclusive anyway. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's the thing, the perfect way to, to end on this. You know, you're not re- your rejection. You can you can kind of build from there as long as you take your time to really learn from it. It's just on on to the next one, really. So, uh, but I could talk to you all day, man. But this has been really helpful. You've uh, you've been a great guest, and I wish you all the best at Google. Sounds like you've got an incredible opportunity here, and I'm sure we're going to be yeah seeing and hearing from you in, in the future for sure. Hope so, and all the best to everyone uh, watching, really, through college or uni or even recent grads. So yeah, and don't be afraid to, as I said, hit people up on LinkedIn. You can hit me up too if you want. Um, advice or a bit more in-depth knowledge of what i've said or something's not clear feel free like my my linkedin's open connect cool. do whatever we'll add we'll add a link to the the show notes so uh cool let's leave it there thanks so much man really appreciate it